The title of my message today is Get Out of the Way. Look at your neighbor and say, Get Out of the Way. Unless it was your spouse, don't say that. No. Um, you know, Galveston is an interesting place because uh, during the winter, it's, it's beautiful, lovely. Nobody's in your way. But when summer hits, I'm like, Get out of my, right? And you're, the driving can be challenging in Galveston in the summer. Can I just get an amen on that from the. Right? And if you're visiting us today, we love you. Spend your money. We're glad you're here. Um, but it just can be cha- more challenging, the driving here. And uh, our, it reminded me of when I was dating Marlo. We had a, a trip. I think we were going to Scotland. I was in Germany. We had a trip to Scotland. We were flying. And I, for some reason, was late uh, getting to the airport. And I'd forgotten my passport. That's why. And I was like, oh, Marlo, i got to go back and get my passport. And she's like, oh, no. What, what am I looking to marry? You know, and anyway... <laughs> We got my passport, and so we have to go very quickly. In fact, I was driving. I found out my Pontiac Grand Am had a governor that at 100 miles an hour, it, it went down. And I'm not a sinner. We were on the Autobahn. It was legal. Uh, but it's crazy. On the Autobahn, when you got up to a car, they, there was a culture. They always moved over. Like, you never had any issues, and people were even passing me at 100. I moved over because that's just what you did. Of course, now I'm driving in Galveston and it, it, there's no get over. Like, it's just, people are like, oh, the beach, honey, it's amazing. And they're both, you know, you're on the seawall. You're like, why did I take seawall? I should have took O, but it is what it is. And, and, and life can seem like that. It can seem like you're trying to get somewhere and people, things, situations are in your way. And if they just get out of my way, then I wouldn't have this problem. And Jairus has this same issue. But what he doesn't realize is the issue is going to help him to get to his miracle. What if, and I just submit this, this is really the sermon in a nutshell for you today. What if God brings collisions, people in your life, not to distract you, but to develop you for what he's called you to be? And so I want to I want to look at this story again from a fresh perspective. Last week we looked at the woman with the issue of blood, but I want to look at from the from the topic of Jay Irish, uh, Jay Irish. Now I'm making them Irish, but uh, <laughs> from Jay Iris, and I want to look at him and see like what was his perspective. And God was kind of blowing my mind this week, and really God was saying this. I want to give you the revelation. I just I want to make sure you're not missing because sometimes I preach things and I'm like I didn't preach that. I don't know where you got that. But so I want to be real clear today. Jairus wasn't ready for his miracle. Jairus came to get a healing, not knowing he needed a resurrection. But God knew he needed a resurrection, but he wasn't ready for it. So God used the woman with the issue of blood to get him ready for what he needed. That's my message. Turn with me to Luke, the eighth chapter. You're like, well, why can't we just go then? Because I got a lot more to say. Um, People are checking off right now online. They're like, I got it. I'm good. Honey, let's go eat. It's noon. Um, Verse 40. On the other side of the lake, the crowds welcomed Jesus because they had been waiting for him. Then a man named Jairus, now I, I know uh, the proper pronunciation is Jairus, but I grew up kind of with the hip hop, so I call him Jairus, so just go with me. <laughs> a leader of the local synagogue came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come home with him. His only daughter, who was about 12 years old, was dying. As Jesus went with him, he he was surrounded by the crowds. A woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding, and she could could find no cure. Coming up behind Jesus, she touched the fringe of his robe. Immediately, the bleeding stopped. Who touched me, Jesus asked. Everyone denied it, and Peter said, Master, this whole crowd has been pressing up against you. It's like a mosh pit at Pantera concert. Uh, Some of you are like, how do you know about Pantera? I don't know. Uh, Verse 46. But Jesus said, somebody deliberately touched me, for I felt healing power go out from me. When the woman realized that she could uh, not stay hidden, she began to tremble and fell to her knees in front of him. The whole crowd heard her explain why she had touched him and that she had been immediately healed. Daughter, he said to her, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. While he was still speaking to her, a messenger arrived from the home of Jairus, the leader of the synagogue. He told him, your daughter is dead. 
there's no use troubling the teacher now. But when Jesus heard what had happened, he said to Jairus, don't be afraid. Look at your neighbor and say, don't be afraid. afraid. Bring that up a little bit, my first point. Don't be afraid, just have faith, then she, and she will be healed. When they arrived at the house, Jesus wouldn't let anyone go in except Peter, John, and James, and the little girl's father and mother. The house was filled with people weeping and wailing. Now, I want to give you a cultural reference real quick, just in a nutshell. Normally in this culture, if you cried the loudest, that meant you loved the most. Well, they got to a place that, you know, it was just difficult to cry really loud. So they began to hire people to cry for them. So it was typical in this culture for you to have a bunch of weeping and wailing and flute players and all that to come to your funeral so they could do the weeping for you. And so this, was, this is what's going on right now is they have these professional weepers there. But Jesus said, stop the weeping. She isn't dead. She's only asleep. But the crowd, these professional wailers, laughed at him because they all knew she had died. Then Jesus took her by the hand and said in a loud voice, my child, get up. And at that moment, her life returned and she immediately stood up. Then Jesus told them to give her something to eat. Her parents were overwhelmed, but Jesus insisted that they not tell anyone what had happened. So if I can paint this picture for you today, we have Jairus who is a religious leader and in the synagogue, uh, uh, synagogue leader, he's way up there. He gets to a place of such desperation because his daughter is at the point of death that he falls down at the feet of Jesus. And so this desperation causes him to disregard his dignity. And and you have to realize this, that God many times brings you to desperate moments in your life because he can't work with your pride. He can't work with your comfort. He can't work as long as you're okay. I just come to church on Sunday, and I'm good the rest of the week. God, I don't want you to touch anything, any part of the rest of my week, but, but then I'll come back and I'll honor you again on Sunday. And many, uh, that, that for, because of that reason, God allows uh, periods of desperation so that you lose your pride and come back to the feet of Jesus. I'm not even to my points yet, but you got to get this, that for you to see a miracle happen, you got to get desperate. you got to disregard dignity. you got to say, Jesus, I need you. Amen. Now, we say that because we just sang songs about Jesus. I don't, I don't need anything else, right? You are my one. Right? They weren't singing those songs in J. Iris' day. Nobody was singing a song about Jesus. He was just this renegade rabbi that was outside the system and miracles were working through him. But because Jairus was desperate, he was willing to go see this guy. And there's something about daughters being sick. Like my son, I got, I got a son and I got daughters. My son's sick, I'm like, dude, you better get over it. <laughs> my daughters, that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother heart string that gets pulled. Right? Can, I, can I get an amen from the fathers with daughters, and right? My wife even said, they, she got you wrapped around your little family. I'm like, which one? All three. <laughs> but there's something about a, a sick daughter that can cause you to get desperate. And this desperate dad falls at the feet of G- disregards his status in life, disregards his education, disregards that he's somebody. And he says, I'm, I'm willing to be a nobody to get this guy to touch my daughter. So Jesus agrees. Jesus goes through this mosh pit crowd agreeing to go to this Jairus' house. And in the midst of going to the house, we have this collision, this interaction, this, that these relationships cross at this point. And I love this because Luke brings this out. It's almost poetic, but God's trying to reveal something, that he's not serendipitous. Things don't just happen, but there's a sovereign hand of God at work in your life. And the detail that Luke gives is that the daughter's how old? Thank you, one person. Twelve years old. Don't worry, you're going to get the second one. I'm, I'm just setting you up. How long was the woman sick for? Oh, she got on the first row. She's ready. Twelve, that could be my daughter right there, two of them. I got two of my daughters on the front row. I didn't know y'all were here today. Y'all messing me up. All right. (laughs) Because I'm preaching about a dead daughter and I got... Anyway, here we go. 12 years though. 12 years. Catch this. 
They were parallel. They, they were lives that didn't interact. And in 12 years, they're going in different directions. The woman who started with prominence because of her sickness has given every dime she had to doctors and it's causing her to, to be a nobody, to have no income, to be in poverty, right? And, and not only is that, but she's also ceremonially unclean. Leviticus 15, the requirements of the law in her society is that anywhere she goes, she sell, says, I'm unclean, I'm unclean, so that nobody gets around her. So she's had no touch, she's outside of relationships, she's on the fringe of society. The, the girl, on the other hand, is she was born. She just started off in life. And she's beginning to reach her dreams and hopes. And at 12 years old in Jewish culture, you were becoming a woman. Like that was, that was the moment of peak and dreams and destinies being released. And she's not a nobody. I mean, she's born in a prominent family. So there's, there's a whole life ahead of her. But it's starting to be cut off. And this collision of their lives come together for a reason. And here's the reason. Jairus thinks he needs a healing, but he really needs a miracle. And his mind frame, his mind frame can't reach it until he goes through the collision. This is powerful because many times we are looking at people and we're saying, get out of my way when God put them in your way so you could reach your destiny. And, and we keep yelling, you know, we're at Walmart, get out of my way, right? Tourists, get out of my way, right? And God's like, it's the thinking. It's the thinking that you have that needs to get out of the way. You catch that? And so I want to go through three things that I think Jairus needs corrected in his thinking before he can ever step in his miracle. The first thing is he has to understand that God is not limited. Come on, I should get an amen from Bible Belt Christians. I'm, I'm supposed to get an amen and say, hold up a second. But y'all didn't even give me an amen. I can't even do my second part of that sermon, right? So... God is not limited. There's no limits to God. Most people would not, head nod with me. But yet we live this life as though life is limited. Uh, uh, economic, uh, economics, economic, I don't know, I can't even say the word right now. People that study economics, economists, <laughs> help me Jesus, I'm getting humbled right here. Just fall at the feet of Jesus. Uh, they say this principle called the scarcity principle. And it's this idea that resources are limited, that there's only so many and that demand or when the demand is greater than the resource, there's this scarcity presented. And so we live this life with you better get your own, you better get your piece, whatever, whatever you need. And so for us to be able to excel in life, sometimes we got to step on people. We don't say it like that, but we got to step on people or over people or we got to do better than our neighbor does. There's no way that because I'm in a competition, if I don't do better than them, I won't get what, you know, God's designed it for my life. I, I, that's the only way I can get it. But I got I to gotta do it of my own strength and I got to live in a place of subtraction so that I can grow in addition. I, I take from you so that I can grow. And the problem with that mentality is it's not kingdom mentality, it's worldly mentality. James describes it like this in James the third chapter, verse 14. But if you are bitterly jealous and there is selfish ambition in your heart, don't cover it up, uh, cover up the truth with boasting and lying. For jealousy and selfishness are not God's kind of wisdom. So it is a wisdom but it's not God's kind of wisdom. Such things are earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. For wherever there is jealousy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and, every, uh, and, e and, and evil of every kind. I want to say every evil word because that's New King James. So in this, in this space, we're trying to get our own. And if we don't operate with kingdom, we can't... We can't live in a place of him being limitless because we're limited. Jairus has this same test. Because if you notice, they're walking to the house. All of a sudden, Jesus stops. When he stops, he says, well, somebody touch me. Peter says, come on, everybody's touching you. And then he says this, 
power has left me. What do you think the thought process of Jairus' mind is right now? He doesn't see him as God right now, just renegade rabbi with some healing power. What would you say? The power left you? I needed that. What you talking about power left you? Like, uh, like now, power ain't supposed to leave you right now. Who touched you right now? Because I need this power for my daughter. What do you got? Go back up to the mountain again and go get it with the father? Like, like how are you going to get this power again? Like I, and, and who took it? Don't we do the same? We roll up in the church. We've been believing for like, like 15 years, and somebody rolls in last week, and they got the sciatic nerve, and you like, God, what? I 15 years of sciatic nerve, and this dude gets it like the first week? I saw his Facebook page. He's still a sinner. <laughs> or Insta, whatever you do. Like, like we do that, and what are we saying when we do that? God, you're really limited. We're saying, I need to get mine. Yeah, God has great promises out, but I got to get my power. And if somebody comes in and takes what we think is ours, and we don't have a hand that's generous, we actually get what we believe. Uh, I think about the uh, Elijah. He declares there's going to be a famine for three years across the land, and then he goes to a widow's house. And he says, hey, uh, you got my meal. And she's like, what? I mean, just think if like a news organization was interviewing that. Some pastor came by and said they needed this last meal from this widow. Mm, I'm preaching good. I'm just shocking y'all right now. That's what he does. He goes up to this widow and she's like, I was going to cook this last meal. Me and my son were going to eat it and just die. I mean, that's how bad it was. And he says, no, give it to me. She does. And she never suffers lack again. Because what was she doing to step into her miracle? She was having an open hand. And until you believe that God is limitless, that, he's, that, he, that there's nothing that can contain Him, that you will, you'll believe that, man, i got to get my own, but you're operating with the wrong wisdom. We, we see this with society. Like even science is proving this out. Like we've heard for 50 years, maybe even 80 years, that we're, we're going to overpopulate the earth. Like Bill Gates and Thanos, are, like they've been telling us this for years. Right? Because there's only so many resources. But what we find out is that technology keeps pushing us forward. That we're able to do more with less. That, that, and, and I say technology. What if I give you the spiritual world word? God's pouring out revelation and information. It's, it's funny because we, we've been trained. There's too many people on the earth. Who told you that? It wasn't God. God said be fruitful in what? But you decided to listen to Bill Gates. I say his name, YouTube cuts it out. That's what's crazy. That's why I'm saying it twice, just to see if they do it this time. <laughs> but what if God is limitless? And what if an open hand, meaning I'm not trying to take care of myself, I'm not trying to get my own, I'm trying to be generous, that releases that kind of power. Jairus has, for him to go from just a healing to a resurrection, he has to believe this. I had this with my own life. There was a, a pastor that started about the same time as I did in 2010, and his church was about the same size. We were about the same age. I was a little bit better looking. <laughs> True story. Um, but his church exploded. People were coming out of the woodwork to come. Like, he'd take a picture of Easter, 1,000 plus people there. Like, we took pictures of the eggs at Easter because we didn't want to know, we didn't want you to know nobody showed up. Like, that's it. And I, heard, I was in my prayer time one time, just in 16, just praying and seeking the Lord. And God says, you're jealous. I said, what, what, what do you mean I'm jealous? And he showed me that man's ministry. He said, you're jealous of his ministry. I said, Lord, I ain't jealous. Like, you're going to argue with the Lord and that's going to get somewhere. He said, no, you're jealous. And I said, oh, God, God, I don't want to be jealous. He said, I want you to write him a check every month. Above your tithes, above your offering, I want you to write his ministry a check every month. And I said, Lord, he's got more people and more money. He should be writing me a check, right? 
law of scarcity. But I don't step into God's kingdom unless I do this. So every month I wrote him a check. I wrote, I wrote his ministry a check. Put it in the mail because I work on Sundays. Nobody likes that joke. You ain't working past. Pastors don't work. Spend a day in my shoes. A day. Well, I, just come with me to one marriage counseling session. Just one. And you'll be like, I would rather dig ditches right now. I could say so much more, but I'm not. All right. So Jairus, Jairus, hear me. He decides to allow this to happen. This now steps into the second point I want you to get, is that God uses delay. God uses delay. Typically, when we pray about something, if it doesn't happen in whatever timetable that we've set for God then we take it as a denial. And really, the delay is about development. What God is trying to say when He... Brother, I am so glad you were here today. It's been so long. Y'all mind if I just take a time? I want to pray for you. I've been praying and thinking about you, Father. I just thank you right now in Jesus' name. I thank you for your healing power working throughout His body. Father, I thank you that He was a minister of the gospel. Body, I speak to you and command you to be whole right now. In Jesus' name I pray. We thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God uses delay, and the delay is about your development. We see this with Jairus. What do I mean by Jairus? He is in a desperate moment, and time is of the essence. I need you to get to my daughter. She's about to die. And when the delay happens, I don't know if it was 15 minutes, 30 minutes. We just roll over it in the scriptures. We don't think much about it. But it says she stopped. She had to come forward. She explained her story. We're there for a bit of time. And in the midst of this stoppage, this delay, J. Iris gets news. She's not sick anymore. She's dead. So the delay caused the death. You ever been in a place where you were praying about something and it went from bad to worse? And you were like, God, where were you? And many of us take that. We interpret it as God wasn't there or God didn't want to answer it or God's not into it. But what if he was really just trying to develop something? What if the delay is intentional like he did with Lazarus, right? He whom you love is sick. And it says in the scriptures, he loved him so much, he waited three days. Why is that? Because God's way more concerned with your faith than your comfort. That's what James writes. James writes this in the first chapter, the second verse. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity. This is a test. For great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. So Jairus thinks he needs a healing, but God knows he needs a resurrection. And God has to bring a series of mental changes in his understanding. One of those is a delay. Can you trust me when I don't do it on your timetable? Can you allow this woman to get my power and healing before you get the power and healing? Because God... uh, Let me say it like this. I I taught the sermon. Usually I teach it to my kids before I preach it, but I... I did it to the middle schoolers. There's a couple of middle schoolers in uh, Fellowship Hall before the nine. So I said, hey, let me give you my sermon. And I got to this point. And I said, what's your favorite toy? And one of them told me it was like a, a gaming console, like Xbox or something like that. Another told me, uh, I want to call it figurines, but it, it was a guy. So it, collectibles. It was collectibles. <laughs> and, and I said this, if I gave you those toys when you were two years old, what would have happened? 
they said, I would have destroyed them. And what if God wants to bring you to your miracle, but your character's not developed yet to maintain it, to steward over it? For my own life, I was engaged in 2006. I was about to be married, and that engagement got broken off. And I, I, I got into great grief. I was struggling. And God came to me in my prayer time when I was like, God, what? I thought you promised me a wife. What's going on? God came to me in my prayer time and said, you're not ready to be married. And then he took his Holy Ghost flashlight and, and poured it on my life to the area of sin that I'd covered up. And I was like, oh, no, I just that, that's okay. I can, I can take that into my relationship. And God's like, you need to deal with that or you'll mess up your marriage. And so I did that for 30 days. I went through a discipleship and dealt with that specific area of my life. And as I'm dealing with it, God's removing the junk. And then all of a sudden, a little bit later, I meet this cute girl that came from Arizona. (laughs) Hallelujah. Y'all know who I'm talking about, Sophia? Yeah, you 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 were the blessing that came out of that blessing. Which reminds me that we have these collisions with people and we think of them as problems because they're costing us time. But what if they're really developing you? See, uh, uh, Mike Sassar, he's a, he's a movie star. Many, many of y'all didn't know that, but Mike Sassar is a movie star. Uh, and, and Mike, if he wanted to be successful by the world's standards, he would hobnob, he would... Uh, network with A-list actors. He would he would find the best. Like if he got an opportunity to me- meet the Russo brothers, great directors. Like he wants to rub elbows with those guys. But the kingdom of God works in a different networking way. And God doesn't bring people in your across your path that you think can promote you. He actually brings an outcast. uh, uh, people that you think are are downtrodden. There's no way they're going to help me in life. I only pour into them. He brings those people as a test to see if you truly trust him to promote promote you. Oh, y'all don't like that. So then that, that now that gets me to examine my relationships. Who have I, who have I looked at and said, why am I even helping you out? You can't help me. Some of y'all said that about your spouse. And I'm like, what? what's wrong with you? You pick them. Some of you are like, my spouse is a problem. And Jesus is like, you picked them? What do you want me to tell you? You picked them. Sorry. We don't live in a arranged married society, do we? Like, you picked your partner. You need to ruck up. Marlo's going to get text on that one. So, uh. <laughs> All right. C- catch this, though, that Jesus is all about bringing people, bringing people in your life that you think you're just pouring into so that it develops you for the promotion that he's called you to. He says this in a parable, right? He says, when you have a party, I want you to invite people that can't invite you back. I want you to invite the, the, the people that are homeless and outcasts. Like, that's the people I want you to be friends with. Amen. You're like, what, Jesus, what about the, I want to, I want to, Russo brothers. God, I'm a movie star. <laughs> right? And he's like, no. Uh, the writer of Hebrews says that we entertain angels unaware. It's, it's when you say, this person that came across my path, there's a reason for it. And it's not to delay me, it's to develop me. Y'all got me? Some of y'all are ready for the third point. I don't blame you, I am too. All right, this is my third time to preach this today. Last thing, you have to have a mentality for a miracle that gets God outside of the box. The only person that should be in your box is Jack when you go out to eat. Um, Dad jokes for days. All right. uh, Clear understanding that God does the miraculous 
And many times he stretches your understanding of him so that he can do it. We, we have this with Jairus because the woman with the issue of blood, she's actually breaking Levitical code to be out there. Leviticus, the 15th chapter, we talked about it last week. She's supposed to yell out when she's out in public, unclean, loud, bold. She's not supposed to be around anybody, quarantine. When she gets close, I'm unclean. She definitely can't touch somebody. And she goes past that Levitical mosaic law given by God, and she touches Jesus. When she touches Jesus, who's the highest authority there to enforce that standard? Jairus, yet he stays silent. Now, him staying silent is very important because in this collision, if he brings condemnation instead of compassion, he won't be able to step into his miracle. You say, why is that? Because remember, the daughter, I ain't done yet. It's going to be good. Just give me a second. <laughs> Y'all like, come on, Pastor, you would tell us to clap all the time. I'm clapping. Now, this is, when I studied, this blew my mind. This blew my mind. Leviticus 15 says she's not supposed to touch. She touches, Jairus stays silent. Well, his miracle, his miracle goes from healing to resurrection. Well, the only problem with resurrection is Leviticus 21 says a priest or a rabbi can't touch the dead unless they're immediate family. So if he brings condemnation... He already denies himself the miraculous happening with his daughter. Because Jesus can't go in and touch them. So God, through his silence, stretches his theological understanding of who Jesus is beyond being a rabbi, bigger than the law, because he came to fulfill it, but not just fulfill it, also turn those things that are unclean clean which he sees with the woman of Jairus and so when Leviticus 21 comes up in his mind because it definitely came up he, he's not somebody that was like I wonder what the scripture says he knew he knew he could go past Jesus being unclean because he was going to bring resurrection Ooh. but yet if he brings judgment then he denies himself the miracle. Now, I know some of you are like, oh, a big deal. Why is that even important? Apply that to your life then. How many times have you denied yourself the miracle because you brought judgment instead of mercy? Oh, Jesus. That's why James, the second chapter, I just give you a verse. Verse 12 says this, So whatever you say and whatever you do, remember that you will be judged by the law that sets you free. There will be no mercy for those who have uh, not shown mercy to others. But if you have been merciful, God will be merciful when He judges you. I love the New King James when it finishes it off. It says, uh, mercy triumphs over judgment. So you gotta, you got to catch this, my friends, that mercy triumphs over judgment. And God is stretching Jairus' legal box to show him that Jesus is not just a healing rabbi. But he is the resurrection. But he's got to be willing to be merciful to this woman so he can receive his own mercy. So for our own lives, we have to learn that God has been merciful with us and it's represented in how we're merciful with others for us to step in the miraculous. Uh, New Testament. Y'all going to read this in your living groups. It's going to be Acts the 10th chapter. I want you to read the whole chapter. Verse 15, I want you to key in on. It's this. Uh, it, it talks about Peter. He's at Simon, uh, Simon's house. He's a little hungry. He's praying. It's about noon. And God drops down this sheet of animals and reptiles and birds. I guess God was a Cajun or something. Because he says, kill and eat. I need my Cajun like that joke. And, 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 and Peter's like, I can't, I can't eat anything unclean. And then God says this in verse 15. Do not call what's unclean what I have made clean. And here's where the miraculous has hurt the church. Let me tell you where it's hurt the church. We've kept declaring something unclean that God has made clean. 
And usually, it's within our own soul. I didn't read it in, in Mark, the fifth chapter. It's very interesting because Jesus comes in. He says, the girl's not dead. She's sleeping. They laugh at him, just like the, Luke points it out. But in Mark's gospel, he says, they kicked them all out. And see, for you to walk in the miraculous, you've got to kick out that wrong thinking that keeps declaring you as unclean if God has made you clean. Oh, I'm about to preach right now. See, because we've developed generations of churches that just run around saying, I'm a sinner saved by grace. You say, well, what's wrong with that? I, I got that we were sinners. I got that we needed salvation. But here's my problem. When I said yes to Jesus, what happened to me? Was I claimed or not claimed? Then why do I keep calling something unclean that God calls clean? And until the, the only way that you walk in the miraculous path, because I hear so many people, we need holiness, we need repentance, if we're going to have revival. No, we need a revelation of righteousness. We need to understand what Jesus did on the cross. When we have that understanding, what happens then is we begin to rise to our understanding. But we can't, until this mind changes, we'll never step in the miracle of walking in, like Jesus walked. Ooh, I got an amen from my daughter on the front row. That's all I needed. Her amen's going to my conclusion story. Y'all were going to get another story, but her amen's enough. Y'all can thank her later. <laughs> no, sorry, Sophie. I got a, one more statement, and then I will go on. <laughs> but we have built churches that have declared people unclean even after they have given their hearts to the Lord. We say you're born again, but you're still unclean. And God clearly says, don't call something unclean that I've made clean. And you will never walk in the miraculous power of God because you think you've got to do something to get the miracle. And then you do, and it's, it shows up you got that mentality? It shows up when you judge women, women with the issue of blood. You judge people that get in your way because they're stopping what God wants to do in your life. When really he's using them to develop you. You catch that? And that's the power of the cross. That's how God changes how you're thinking so that you can walk in your Miracle, 1230. I'm like, do I want to close with a story or we just get out of here? What are y'all thinking? Come on, just a little bit more. That's only like 30 of you. <laughs> There's a hundred of y'all here right now. Uh, amen, come on. So um, why this is powerful is because I have seen in my own life God stretch my theological box where I know my mom would call me and she would tell me that she's been my spiritual mother she'd call me that's Mimi she'd call me and she'd say you know God's working a revival in these meetings and they see gold dust appearing and I was like now I didn't tell her this because I love my mama and I ain't trying to get smacked upside the head even across the phone but I say, that doesn't happen. Like, where do you get that in the Bible? Like, that's just strange. That, like, it, I had no framework theologically for it. So I just wrote it off. Like, my mom's just a nut. She just follows those nutty people, right? Until it happened to me. And in 2016, I began to seek the Lord. And I get hooked up with Todd White's ministry. 2017, in January, I head to the Dominican Republic. And we start praying for people, see God working in miraculous ways. And then I'm at Chili's with a group. Todd's not even there. It's just the group of people. We're at Chili's. And the guy next to me starts having gold dust appear on him. And I'm like, what is this, Jesus? Like, this, you know, this can't happen, right? Where's the scripture and verse? And, and we were having a great time in the Lord. Like, you would have thought we had margaritas at the table. We were just so, like, 
just water, but we were just having such fun in the Lord. I, I remember going to the bathroom, and I was just like so like blitzed in the Lord, and I was like, this is awesome. And I used the restroom, and then I went to wash my hands, and I saw like a gold dust on my hands. Like, I, I can't wash my hands now. <laughs> I washed them, but I was like, I can't. <laughs> and so God blew my mind, and it didn't stop there. 2017, two weeks later from that trip, Dan Moeller, who passed through Todd White, comes to our church. It's a miracle he came. It was, it was a God moment. And he's there, and we're not as big as we were. There was a kind of an aisle in the middle, and it was only one service, and he'd preach the whole weekend. Well, that's Sunday, and I'm sitting right where you're at. And he begins to preach, and there's gold dust all around his lips. And I'm like, what? In the, I want to stop the service. I'm like rubbing my eyes. I'm like, does anybody else see this? Like, we got to test. It's like, let me scrape his lip, get it tested, sell it for some cash, you know? But greater than the manifestation was the message. And God spoke to my heart. Now, this is what, because cool, cool manifestation, but it ain't changing my life. But what he spoke to me changed my life. And he said this to me. He said, I'm blessing this gospel. And when he said that, I said, what? And so I stole every message Dan Muller preached. Like, ripped. in fact, when he came in 2022, I was like, uh, Dan, I've been, I've been stealing your messages. I'm just saying. <laughs> He's like, it's cool, brother. I got it from Jesus. And, uh, <laughs> but as I began to preach... That identity, that healing, that revelation of righteousness, our church began to grow. God was blessing that message. But I was never stepping into my miracle until he stretched my box. We all bow our heads together today. You know, I never want to close this service without giving you an opportunity to know Jesus. We all start off unclean. We all start off sinners. And without Jesus dying on the cross, there is no hope. But yet in the midst of our sin, in our struggles, in our wrong choices and selfishness, God says, I'm going to show you my love by sending my son. And if you say yes to this free gift, you say, yes, I want, I want to be free of myself. I want to follow you, Jesus. He cleanses your slate and makes you brand new. Are you tired of living for self? Are you tired of sin? Today is your day of change. I, I know I can hear it. Oh, Pastor, I, I'll come to the Lord when I get my heart right. Or when, when I get this out of my life, then, then I'm ready. My friends, you're a good Galvestonian. You know you have to catch a fish before you clean it. And when you come to God, He's the one that makes you clean, not you. And all He's looking for today is a yes. Or maybe you've said a prayer at some point, but if you were to examine your heart, you say, you know what, I'm, I'm not living right. I'm like you, Pastor. The Holy Ghost is shining that flashlight. There's just some things that I need to change. I want you to know this, that God is for you. I'm, I'm the grandson of a pastor. I'd given my heart to the Lord at a young age, but through a series of disappointments, I strayed away from God. And yet in the midst of my struggle, through many invites to church from my father and prayers of my mother, I went back to God and I rededicated my life to Him. Never to be the same again. Not perfect, but I was changed. If that's you today, you want to say yes to God for a first time, or you want to rededicate your life to God, could you just raise your hand high in the air? I want to pray with you. Amen, amen, amen. A day of brand new beginnings. A day of a fresh start. A day of you going from being unclean to made clean. Anybody else? If you're online and you want prayer, just say, Pastor, pray for me. Father, you see all those hands lifted up towards you. God, we just ask right now that you would cleanse us from all of our sins. We want to change. So change our hearts through the blood of Jesus. Jesus, we believe you died on the cross and rose again. 
and you're seated at the right hand of the Father. And God, you're more than a God. You're now our Father. Teach us and guide us. Holy Spirit, fill us right now. Fill us to a place of overflow. In Jesus' name I pray. And the people of God said, if you can just repeat this after me, everybody say, Jesus is Lord. I believe with that simple prayer and confession, you are brand new in the kingdom of God. It says, old things have passed away, all things are new. I want to give you two words today. Welcome home. Welcome home. You're in the family of God.